Welcome everybody to the Lighthouse Project. My name is Michael Bavel and I will be your host for the night. And again, um, it's an incredible, incredible thing to continuously be bringing in incredible speakers and uh, Torah speakers that really inspire us uh, to get us close to Hashem. And tonight is an incredible one. So I want to say, and I mentioned uh, to the Brother Kessin today, that throughout the seven years that we've done here Lighthouse Project, we've had an incredible amount of big names nonstop coming here to South Florida, coming through these, this incredible room and the other room as well, incredible events. And, you know, throughout the years, I always uh, had a thing with listening to Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Mendel Kessin, both of them incredible, incredible teachers. The main thing that always inspired me to listen to them is to constantly think about, dream about, and really feel when Mashiach is coming. And um, if anybody ever wants to know what it's like to feel like the heart and the beat of like where we're at today with regards to Mashiach, Rav Kessin, who you'll hear from tonight, is one of the most uh, uh, important people in the world today who's letting you know exactly where we're at today. Even with, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier today, we did a quick Facebook Live, a big event happened today, which I think Rav Kessin, who I got to break the news to him, was kind of exciting to let him know about what happened today, that I think uh, we are very, very, very close. And um, with that being said, I just want to say one more thing to all you guys. And um, I, I was uh, yesterday, yesterday, over Shabbat, uh, Parsha Bechalot, which we just finished right now, uh, it's a very important statement that said that Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble of them all. And I, uh, I have overheard this incredible Torah, Torah from the Rebbe Rashab. And he said, this is the, not the, pre, not the, the previous Torah, but two before that. And he said something unbelievable that really should give all of you guys a tremendous amount of chizik. He said, he said like this. He said that when Moshe Rabbeinu, he looked into the book of Adam <clears throat> and he saw all the different sages and tzaddikim and righteous leaders that were going to be around throughout all the generations. And he said that when he looked and he witnessed the footsteps of Mashiach, literally the time that we're in right now, he saw that all of us would have, and I quote, a modest conception of divinity in serving God with our mind and our hearts, and we would never attain this loftiest peak of Avoda. We wouldn't be able to do what they used to do a long time ago. But we would observe the Torah with simplicity and a spirit of self-sacrifice. And he saw that at this specific time right now, the joy that it would bring in the heavens above. We are in a generation that is the most difficult generation right before Mashiach. We have so many reasons not to get connected to Hashem between everything that's going on in the world today. And yet, you have to know that all of you guys are here today. You could be doing a lot of things right now, but you came here to learn Torah. And with that is an incredible thing. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he says that he was the most humble person, he was humble that they even, could, he couldn't conceive. He would think that if he was in just generation, he wouldn't be able to make it. And yet here we all are here right now, learning Torah uh, together in Aftas. Um, and it's an incredible thing. It should give you guys a lot of comfort and, and understanding that Hashem loves what we're doing right now. It's not a simple matter. I'm just here to learn Torah. We're here to get close to Hashem. And, and as it said in heaven right now, they're smiling. So really, you should give you guys, each other, all of us, a round of applause. It's an amazing thing. I want to thank one of tonight's sponsors, Dr. Rabbi Warren Castle. <laughs> who uh, is a, a Talmud of Rav Shimon Kessin, and I thought it'd be apropos that he can introduce the Rav. It's a pleasure to greet all of you here this evening. Those of you who are here live, those of you who are joining us via social media, and the various outlets that are available to people uh, near and far. I've been learning with Harav Shimon Kessin for the last a little bit over five years. And if you were to ask me who I was before that time, I could not tell you because I simply don't remember. Uh, 
That's the kind of impact. So let me tell you a little bit about my Rebbe. Uh, he is the most well-traveled Torah observant Jew in the history of our religion, going back to Avram Avinu. He has visited over 200, what, 226 countries, 226 countries throughout the world, which is a story in and of itself. Uh, he is a noted expert in the Ramchal, Haramosha Chaim Lutzato, who lived in the 1700s. Uh, his Kabbalistic connections are worthy of a sheer, actually a full-blown three-credit class uh, in and of itself. And he's an expert in his works. He is a mechadesh, he innovates, he's a thinker, uh, and he has his own fidushim in hashkafa, in Jewish philosophy, the Jewish outlook on various topics as well. Uh, he's a marriage and family therapist in Brooklyn, licensed in the state of New York, treats people throughout the country. Those that can come to him in person do, those that can't meet with him over, uh, you know, the various forms of communication that we have available to us uh, today. Uh, he's a remarkably gifted human being and indeed one of the most profound brachot that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has ever graced my family and myself with. So with that in mind, it is great. It's a great public for me to introduce to you Rav Shimon Kessler. Most people think they know about what will happen if the Mashiach arrives. They have some idea and so on. But really, that's a very important question. You know, the real question is, if the Mashiach comes and he will come very shortly, what exactly will he do? I mean, he's an exceptional individual. And the real question is, what does he do when he comes? You know, he's going to say hello to all of you, of course, and so on. And he's going to do certain things which are very strange. The truth is most people have no idea of what he's going to do. It's like we're waiting for someone to come and appear in front of us without having any idea about what he's going to do or anything really known about him. When people think of the Mashiach, they think, first of all, well, he's going to come and restore all the Jews back to Eretz world. He's going to take them out from the exile or the Golas among the Goyim in the world. And he's going to bring all of them back to Eretz world. But the truth, the Mashiach will not do that because Elal could do that much better. So what is he going to really do? That's the question. You know, well, one thing we do know, because that's what the Pesach says, Umolo Deis Hashem, Now that is a verse in the Torah that says, and the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God, like the waters cover the sea. So we have some idea that he's going to give us a certain conception or sensation almost of God himself. in our mind. You know, he's not really a reality, just an idea. And what we think of him in certain ways as a very great being who is all wise, all powerful, all knowing, and all present. That's how we think of God. But he's going to restore the knowledge of God in a way that we have really very, we've really uh, very uh, little know about what that is and so on. And the real question is, how is he going to do that? No one has ever been able to do that in history. Even Moshe Rabbeinu at Mount Sinai wasn't able to really do that. He was only able to restore to some degree the knowledge of God when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai. But even then the Jews rebelled even after that and they worshiped the golden calf. So really, how effective was Moshe Rabbeinu in letting us have some idea about God? Well, he was effective in a way because he started in a certain sense. 
the Jewish people as a nation. But he obviously was not very effective because right after that, the Jewish people started to worship a golden calf and so on. So how is this posik, how does this verse tell us what the Mashiach will do? How is he going to do it? Nobody has ever been able to do this at all. People believe in God, or they don't believe in God. But it says in the Pusik that he will be able to convince us in a certain way with absolute certainty that God <clears throat> exists. And God will almost become like a sensory experience. I mean, we will not be able to see God in any real sense, but we will all have a secure knowledge of the existence of God. And the real question is, how is he going to do this? No one has ever done this throughout human history. And I mean, not only to the Jewish people will he do this. He will do this even to the Goyim. The Goyim at that time will all become believers in God, in the Jewish God. They will simply throw out all their versions of who God is, whether that God is Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or the Hindu deities for good and forever. So this is a great power that he will have. And the real question that we want to ask is, how does he do it? What is he going to tell us? Actually, <clears throat> there are three questions that I'm going to try and answer today. And I'm going to try to give you an understanding of the answer to these three questions. And they're very powerful questions. First of all, it says that the Mashiach will come someday and talk to us all. Why? If according to the Pasuk, the Mashiach will restore the belief in God with an absolute certainty, why do we need a Mashiach to do that? Because that seems to be the fundamental property of Olam Haba, the future world. In the future world, when we will go to after this world called Olam Hazeh, is over, everyone will clearly understand the existence of God. And not only that, that goal, that, that goal will be eternal. Olam Abba is a world which will not simply come and, and pass us by. It's going to be with us forever. That's right. It's a world which goes on forever. That's why it's called the Olam Hanitzchias, the eternal world. And how is that eternal? Because I'll tell you a very, a, a very in, interesting secret. There will be no time. In other words, it's called Nitzchi, it's eternal. Because it's eternal, it has nothing to do with time. In other words, there's no past, no present, and there's no future. Could you imagine a world like that, where there's no sense of time, past, present, and future? That's impossible. You know what I mean? To even imagine that there can be an existence which is not based on time. It's also not based on space. There will be no separation between us. We will know each other as individuals, but there will be no real sense of separation or individuation between people. So there's no time and there's no space. Not only that, there will be no such thing as an action. We won't do anything in the normal sense of the word. Now, one may say, well, what kind of existence is this? And the truth of the matter is, we have no idea. But in a certain sense, we will be like angels in the way we exist. And that cannot really be comprehended and so on. But this is what God tells us. This is Olam Haba. So therefore, if we will have Olam Haba, which gives a distinct existence to people, why do we need a period called the Mos HaMashiach, the days of the Messiah? Why? If the Mashiach is going to restore the belief in God and the knowledge of God to the whole mankind, those days are actually the end of the physical universe. The last days of physicality, which according to the Talmud, will occur in the year 6,000. It is now 5,782 years. That means that technically speaking, according to the Talmud, the world will not go beyond 
the year 6000. So we only have 218 years left. You realize that? You're making plans for what's going to happen. You're going to go on vacation. You're going to save some money and you're going to go and so on. I got news for you. The world is not scheduled to go beyond the year 6,000. <laughs> In other words, that will be the end of physicality. You know, physicality. I touch myself. I'm a body. And this will not exist beyond the year 6,000. So after the year 6,000 will be the time called Olam Abba, the future world, which is eternal. So therefore, we see that the knowledge of God will occur in the year 6,000 automatically. So why is it important for the Mashiach to come? He's simply repeating what's going to exist anyway. So what are we all waiting for? What are we waiting for this circumstance called the days of the Mashiach? That's number one. Number two, did you know that there were two Mashiachs? That's right. Most people don't even know that. The Mashiach that we are all waiting, he is called the Mashiach Ben David, the, the Davidic Messiah. He is descended from Dover Amelech, King David. And that's the one we're waiting for. In Yalav Yavoy, it says Mashiach Ben David. And all over the prayers and so on, it refers to the Mashiach, the descendant of David. But there's another Mashiach, that's right. There's another Mashiach whose name is Mashiach ben Yosef, the Josephine Mashiach. And who is that? And what does he do? You know, if you have a Mashiach, isn't it enough to have one? You have to have two, you know? I realize people like to collect money and accumulate as much as they can. But who wants to accumulate two Mashiachs? In fact, very few people know about the second one. But I will tell you this, that the one who we are waiting for is not the Mashiach Pandava, the Davidic Messiah, even though he's the one who's always mentioned in our prayers. The one that we're waiting for, the one that will redeem us in the world and bring the knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea is the Joseph Messiah. That's right. Not the Davidic Messiah. The Davidic Messiah will appear after him in the second role. But the actual Messiah who will redeem the Jewish people at the end of time and place them in the land of Israel and so on. And he will bring this knowledge of God to the whole world is the Joseph Mashiach. And pray tell, what in heaven's name does he do? Now, I doubt if anyone in this room has any idea what he will do. But without a knowledge of that Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach descended from Yosef in a sense, without that knowledge, you will have no idea really what he does. So I would like to answer that question tonight in terms of what does he do? In other words, what you see, I seem to be doing is thoroughly confusing all of you. You all walked in tonight and thought, okay, he's going to talk about Mashiach. He's going to talk about the Mashiach Ben David, the Davidic Messiah. No, I will not. I will talk about both Mashiachs, the Davidic Mashiach and the Joseph Mashiach. Well, what we do? This is an absolute shock. Am I in the right place? Or did I get the wrong address? Finally, the most important question of all. Why in heaven's name hasn't the Mashiach appeared yet? You know that if the world will end in the year 6000 from other Mauritian, 96 or 97% of human history has already evolved. That's right. We're almost at the end of history. You know what I mean? Why? Why is it taking so long for either Mashiach, the Davidic Mashiach, or the Joseph Mashiach to appear? The prophets, Zechariah Hanavi, Yeshaya Hanavi, Yecheskel Hanavi, they all talked about the Mashiach as if he was coming tomorrow or a year from then. 
or 20 years. But nobody can believe that they're talking about a person who hasn't come in thousands and thousands of years because they all lived about 3,000 to 2,000 years ago. So that means that the person that they're talking about has not arrived in any sense. Neither Mashiach has come. So the real question that we have, and which we're agonizing over, where is the guy? This guy that's supposed to come, I'm sitting and waiting for thousands of years, and he has never shown up. He has never even shown up and said, hi, hello. You know, so what, what is exactly is going on? What does Judaism mean when it says that the Mashiach will come? When does that happen? And so on. So I'm going to try and answer you in a way so you'll understand why it's taken him so long to show up. So obviously, based on these questions, we really don't understand who the Mashiach is and what he will do. Because these questions reverse or refute everything we've learned about Mashiach. So really, the question really is, is what is Mashiach? Who is Mashiach? How many Mashiach are there? Why has he come for so long and so on? You mean? And why is there a Yemosa Mashiach in the first place? We don't need the Mashiach. What we need is Olam Abba. That's what we're all waiting for, the future world. We're not waiting for the Mashiach. Yet this is a fundamental belief in Judaism that the Mashiach has to come. Now, to answer this question, I'm going to have to temporarily move to another question. I'm sorry. I'm not simply being Jewish. I'm trying to discuss fundamentally a very important issue. And the main issue that I'm trying to discuss is why did God create us? Why did he create us? What does he need us for? He has absolutely no need for the human race. God, as he is all-powerful, is absolutely alone. We can't even comprehend who God is. It's said that Engel Bovado, that God has no outside. He exists. There's nothing that exists outside of him. He has no what's called other. He doesn't see anyone else but him. He is only himself. He is absolutely one in a way where there's no possibility of another. So therefore, God, in whatever way he is, is absolutely alone, and he will be alone forever. So why suddenly does he create me or you or anyone? He surely doesn't need us. He is not lonely. He is not neurotic and so on. So therefore, why does he do this? So the answer is very deep and so on. And I'm gonna try and answer it in some way. You see, because there's something about God which is similar to us. When you look at everything in the universe, every entity in the universe, you will see that there are two types of entities. There's an entity called the human being who is fundamentally a subject what does that mean? Every one of you in this room knows himself. If you close your eyes temporarily right now, and I say, what do you see? And you will say, I see myself. I see me. I know me. What? How do you know you? What does that mean? You know yourself in yourself. You have the gift of saying me. That's an incredible gift because nothing else can say me in the universe. For example, if you're looking at the sun, well, the sun is 93 million miles away and the sun is almost a million miles in diameter. And in the interior of the sun, it's approximately almost 50 million degrees. Now that's hot. It's even hotter than Miami and so on. But yet the one thing about the sun is that the son does not know that he's the son. You can't have a conversation with him. 
You can't say to him, well, you're the son and I'm me. He cannot return the remark and say, well, I am the son and you are you. He is unable to have a discussion. He's unable to refer to himself and even know himself. He's what's called an object. And every galaxy in the universe, astronomers estimate there are perhaps at least 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 100 billion stars. God, that's a huge number. And they estimate that there are at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Well, that means that the number of stars in the universe is a one with about 24 zeros after it. Each one at least the size of the sun. That's a lot of work. Even for God, it seems. But it's not any work at all. The greatest piece of work that God ever made is you. Is the being, the person who can say, me. Now, you may consider this a small thing. But this is an absolute miracle that you can refer to yourself as me. And you know that you exist. And you don't need the assistance of anyone else to tell you you exist. Therefore, the human being is the most incredible thing that God made. Because just like God can say me, you can say me too. So therefore you have a certain quality which is somewhat similar to God. And that's why in the Apostle Continuum it says, man is only somewhat less than God because he has properties and characteristics which are somewhat similar to God. You can have a conversation with another person. You cannot have a conversation with anything in this room. You can't have a conversation with the chair. You can't have a conversation with the books. No, the only one who can have a conversation is another person. So therefore, a person, a human being, is somewhat like God in the sense that you can have a conversation with that person. So why does God make another person? Why? Because he wants to, and no one knows the real thoroughly, the real reason. God wanted to create a human being so that he can share with that human being eternity. You will not live like God. You will not exist like God. But in a certain way, you will be like a junior partner in a law firm. Whereas he's a senior partner, and you're the junior partner because you are that holy and that great. And God wants to give the ability of this junior partner to exist with eternity. It means you will never end. You will never end. You will go on and on and on without time. Now, this seems to be a, a very powerful possibility. But this is what the Torah tells us. And this is called Olam Abba. And in that state, you will be in a state of absolute joy. In Olam Abba, there is nothing but ecstasy in terms of who you are. So whether you realize it or not, you are all looking forward to a kind of existence which is unequal to anything else you've experienced before. And God wanted to do this because he wanted to be treat humans with goodness. This is the goodness that God is offering you when he created you. And that's what we know. God wanted to be good to us and give us the greatest gift of all, which is the ability to exist for eternity without time. <clears throat> but in order to do that, it wasn't that simple. Because God had to say, well, he can't just give you eternity like this. In other words, if you want to exist forever with God, you have to develop a relationship with God. It's as simple as that. God doesn't want to push on you something that you don't want. He wants you to want this relationship. That's right. You can actually have a relationship with something which is totally infinite in a way and beyond our imagination. And he wants, that's right, it's shocking. He wants a relationship with you. And he wants you to choose that relationship with your own free will. So that's why he created everything. That's why he created the universe and everything that's in it. 
so that in some way it can offer a challenge to you to choose them. So therefore, you have one of two choices. Either you can choose to be alone and independent. You know, I am powerful. I can go out there and I can earn a million dollars. I can be a millionaire. I have that possibility. You can believe that. You can believe that you don't need God at all. Or you can understand that there is no existence outside of God. And you have to come on to his existence fundamentally by choice. So therefore, he will not give you eternity unless you want it, unless you choose it. And this is the fundamental tenet of existence itself. In other words, God says, I'm going to give you all eternity. Well, how can you get eternity? Very simple. You have to be plugged in like a, a plug into God because God is the process of existence itself. He creates everything. So therefore, being the process of existence, you have to be plugged into him to exist. And that's where you get the power to exist. And that's where you do it. But you have to want to do that. God says, you can plug into me and you can take from me existence. I am the source of your existence. But you have to want to do that. And how do we show them that we want to do that? How do we show them that we want this kind of relationship? So God gives us mitzvahs. He gives us commandments. Why? God doesn't care what you eat or when you work. That's, God doesn't really care about that. But God simply gives you commandments. Because in following those mitzvahs, you're telling God what you feel about him. You're telling him what your relationship will be with him. And if you choose to make him something important to you, then he will give you the ability to plug into him forever and to coexist with him in a certain way forever. This is incredible. So therefore, God gives us mitzvahs. In the case of the Jewish people, he gave them 630 mitzvahs. Many of those mitzvahs we don't even do. The mitzvahs that have to do with sacrifices, the temple, the mitzvahs that have to do with holidays and with agricultural mitzvahs, in other words. But God sees through the performance of mitzvahs which come from him that you want that relationship. The mitzvah in and of itself has no meaning. Like I say, God does not care what you eat. The laws of kashras are not critical to God, but the laws of kashras tell him God when he says, no, don't eat this, that you want a relationship with him and that he knows why you shouldn't be eating certain foods. And that's all this is really about. That's what the Torah is really about. The Torah is a document, it's a handbook on how you can express the fact that you want that relationship. That's basically what it is. There's nothing magical about it, but God will use that as a barometer that shows him how you feel about him and how you feel about being close to him. And the reward is that you will be close to him and you will enjoy that pleasure forever. So therefore, God wants you to do tikkun. Tikkun means correction. God wants you to correct yourself and determine what the relationship you have with him. That's what he wants. So therefore, having done that, then you have to be judged. God has to look at you and judge. Well, how did you, how did you do? And as I've given you certain mitzvahs that relate to me and tell me what you want me to be with you. And now I'm going to judge you. I'm going to say, did you do the mitzvahs? Did you not do the mitzvahs? Were you interested in me? Do you ever think about me? I know you think about yourself. You think about your physical life. You think about making a living. You think about finding a spouse in some way. You think about children, maybe. You think about all kinds of things that have to do with you. But God says fundamentally, after when you go see him, well, did you ever think of me? Was I, did I mean anything to you in life? So God expects an answer to that. And that's called the attribute of justice. What's called in Hebrew, the midas hadin. So God fundamentally looks at you and he determines exactly what you're saying about your relationship with him. That's called the midas hadin. Now you have to understand something. 
are going to the attribute of justice. This is a very serious thing. You don't realize how serious it is. Because if you're telling God in not doing any of the mitzvahs that you don't want a relationship with him, you want to believe that you want what a relationship only with yourself. You are your own captain of your own ship. So what happens if you don't do the commandments and you have nothing to do with this concept of a relationship? Well, what happens is you unplug yourself from God. That's right. A mitzvah is not simply an action that you do that's not in the Torah. That's not a mitzvah. A mitzvah is an action that you do that says to God, I want you, you're important to me, or I don't want you because you're not important to me. That's it. But that question means that fundamentally, if you don't do the mitzvahs or have any regard for the possibility of this relationship, that you have unplugged yourself from a socket which is in God. And what happens when you unplug from God? What do you think happens? Well, what happens is a very unfortunate event. You suddenly go out of existence. That's right. Because when you're not connected to God's power to grant existence, you're fundamentally saying, I don't need you. So God says, okay, I'll grant you that. And poof, you're out of existence. What does it mean out of existence? There's no measure of consciousness left in you. In other words, whoever you are, if your name is Chaim, there's no more Chaim. Chaim disappears like he never existed. So in other words, according to the attribute of justice, unplugging from God is to consign yourself to doom, non-existence. So people don't realize that. You know, people think if you do the mitzvahs, okay, God is happy. If you don't do the mitzvahs, okay, so God is not happy. That's not what happens. If you unplug yourself from God, you go out of existence. It's as simple as that. So it's much more serious than you have any idea because what you're working on is how long you will be, how long you will exist. And the consequence of the attribute of justice is that if you don't do what God says he wants from you, which is to have a relationship with him, you jeopardize your ability to exist. And this is a very serious thing. So what does God do? So he creates a new attribute called the attribute of mercy. That's what he does. So he says to you, even though you have unplugged yourself from him, that's right, unplug yourself, and you should go out of existence, he will not let go, he will, he will not let you go out of existence. What he does, he plugs you in from a shunt. So in a certain way, you are still connected to God, but not in a direct way. And that's the attribute of mercy. You will still exist. You will still have the possibility to choose him, to choose a relationship with him, even though you're unplugged from him. How does he do that? Well, no one really knows. Even Moses, Moshe, when he said to God, why do people suffer? And so on. God said to him, this is my will. I'm not telling you why. So even Moshe didn't get the ultimate answers of why God does what he does. God hopes by allowing you to exist, even though you've unplugged from him, that you will start to do the mitzvahs. He hopes that you will repent and in certain ways redefine yourself and redirect yourself to start to develop a relationship with him. And he will wait. God is extremely patient. In fact, what God will do, whether you realize or not, and so on, he will bring you back. In other words, after you pass away and you go into the world of heaven and so on, God will say, well, you didn't do a very good job when I first let you go down to the planet. So well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring you back into another person and you'll suddenly become a baby again. You become a new person. And then he will give you a second chance to recommit yourself to him in a relationship. In other words, God will give you several chances because he knows there's a possibility that you, that you will give up. So he will give you another chance and then another chance. So therefore, all of you, whether you realize or not, have been here before. You're all reincarnation of someone who didn't take the job seriously. 
you have no memory of it, of course, because God is now looking at you in this new life today. You have no memory of who you were originally, but you're all reincarnations. So what I say to you all is, hello. Nice to see you again. God is waiting for the choice of developing relationship. So in order to understand these questions that I've asked before of the Mashiach, we're going to have to go back to the first man that God made, Adam Rishon. That's right. The first man that was created by God. And so, and we do have to examine the way he existed. That's right. He wasn't, you see, he wasn't simply a man who was given the commandment, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's much more to it, although the Torah doesn't say that much more. But I'm going to give you a shocking idea of who the first man that ever was created was. Okay? It says in the Torah that the first man who ever existed with his wife, Chava, lived in a place called Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. That's what it says. Now, what was the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden was a physical place. Adam Arishan was a body and a soul together. And he lived in a place which is physical and called Gan Eden. Now, where is the Garden of Eden? Where is it? So the answer is, well, when you try and connect to the Garden of Eden, what do you do? Well, the, what we know is the Garden of Eden or Gan Eden is where the souls go after they die. That's right. Where are the, all the souls? And was, when you say Kaddish or a Yotzite for your father and mother and so on, you're saying the Gan Eden to Heim Nuchosam, let them have a tranquil existence in Gan Eden. And where is Gan Eden? Gan Eden is in heaven. It's not on earth. We refer to Gan Eden as a heavenly place. But wait, it's something that doesn't make sense. Adam Arishan, therefore, did not live in Gan Eden. But the Torah says that he was in Gan Eden. So what does this mean? What does it mean that the Garden of Eden is a physical place for us? It's, it, for us, it's a spiritual place. It's where souls go after they die. But for Adam, it was a physical place. So what does it say? It says something absolutely shocking because what it says is that the physicality of Odomarishan, the first man, was identical to our physicality. That's right. In other words, he lived in Gan Eden, which, was phys which is physical, but that place called Gan Eden was actually in a spiritual form. That means that his physicality was spiritual. As a physical human being in a body with a soul, he really lived in a spiritual place as far as we're concerned. So that shows us that he was much higher than us. That even though he was pushed on the planet Earth and he lived in a physical place, that place where he lived was called Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, which to us is a spiritual place. You don't get to go to Gan Eden until you're dead. That's right. Only dead people are in Gan Eden because that's part of the spiritual universe. Yet for Adam, that was his physical place. So that shows us that the first man, you see, was not like us at all. He was much greater than us. He was actually a physical being who, as far as we're concerned, had a spiritual existence much higher than we can imagine. And this was the life of the first man. So God started mankind in a fundamentally in a physical place, but it was much higher spiritually than us. Not only that, the relationship of physicality to spirituality, body and soul to Adam was much closer to each other. It's like I have two circles, right? One is the physical world and one is the spiritual world. And this, the existence of Adam Rishi, the first man, was something like this. In other words, physicality and spirituality were actually connected. They were not separated. But the Mauritian was able to access a spiritual possibility and a physical possibility at the same time. Because the two worlds, 
physicality and spirituality were really connected together. Well, what does that mean? That means that they never separated. The physical body and the soul were not supposed to separate. What does that mean? That means that there was no such thing as death. That's right. There was no such thing as death. No such thing as catalysis or expiration. Automation was never supposed to die. That's what that means. Because the physical and spiritual world were actually connected. And he was never supposed to die. So what was supposed to happen? What was supposed to happen was that if he did a mitzvah, suddenly his spiritual part, his soul, would overcome the physical and change the nature of physicality. It was supposed to be where his soul suddenly, with the new energy that Adam Mauritian got, the first man got, would suddenly de physicalize his body. His body would actually turn. He would actually look at his body and he would look at his hand and his hand would turn from being physical to becoming spiritual while he was alive. He was never supposed to die. Did you know that? Never. Because God said in the Torah, on the day that you eat from this tree, you will surely die. It means the only time that death becomes possible is if you sin. If you don't sin, forget about it. You're never going to die. So how can you go to a heavenly world? Well, because the soul will be so powerful, it's going to transform your physical existence into a spiritual existence without separating. That's what was supposed to be. I don't know if any of you know this, but this is what other mission was. So therefore, the existence of other mission was completely different than the way we exist now. We have no idea of what that man looked like, what that man was, and so on. Because even though other mission was physical and spiritual, having a body and a soul, the two of them were never supposed to depart from each other. If he had done the mitzvah, then the mitzvah would have created a certain what? It would have affected his physical existence so that suddenly his hand would have become spiritual. His body would have suddenly transformed and become what? Become spiritual. Automatically, without separation. God never intended for there to be a separation between body and soul. And in that new state, he was supposed to go to Olam Haba, which is an eternal world, never dying, never having anything to do. Not only was he not supposed to die, but every animal and every plant was never supposed to die with him. There was never supposed to be anything called death on the world. So wait a minute, but everyone dies. You know, like Mark Twain says, the only thing that's certain is death and taxes. That's all that's certain. So I mean, how did this come about? So the answer is, the answer is because of the sin. Because Adam ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So therefore, by doing that, so suddenly, he created a new energy. And that new energy in Hebrew is called Zoma. The energy of death is the energy of Zoma. It is like a cloud that suddenly came down on the entire universe. And this cloud suddenly made him with the possibility of death. So now the body and soul, which used to be like this, where you, they were connected, never to depart, suddenly became different. It became like this, two separate periods. So the body and soul separated. And once they separated, death became possible. So the punishment of death was given to Adam because he sinned. Now, what does that do? That's pretty bad. Because once you experience death, you cannot create eternity. Once the body and soul are now become separated, separated, you cannot experience eternity. You cannot go to Olam Abba. Because Olam Abba is a place for both physicality and spirituality, where the soul spiritualizes the body 
together and both together go to the future world of all eternity. But having sinned, he made that impossible. So the future world could not appear or be created. This is what happened. Now, this may be very difficult for you to comprehend. Like what I'm saying is like, is this guy for real? I mean, he's telling me that death is not natural. Death is not a natural condition of humanity because mankind was never supposed to die. The original person called the first man, other Mauritian, was never supposed to die. So this is shocking. And the only reason we die and we have to pass away and get buried into the ground is because we induced death upon us by the sin. Because in doing that sin, we canceled the possibility of going to the eternal world. So now the whole circumstance of reality changed. This is what the sin of Adam did. The sin of Adam and Eve at the beginning caused the occurrence of death, caused the occurrence when the physical and spiritual part of a human, the soul and the body would now be separated and they would be torn apart where the body is now buried in the ground and the soul goes up to heaven to deal with its own. Both parts would be separated and the human being in a certain sense would be sliced in half. This is what really is going on. And you will all be shocked when one day you will be confronted with this reality in certain ways. Now that's why, why? That's why one of the most fundamental beliefs in Judaism is the resurrection of the dead. I don't know if you've all heard of that. It's called Chiesa Mesim. In fact, it's the third blessing in Shimon Esrei. We say, Hashem, who resurrects the dead. What? Resurrects the dead? What is that? What, what is, is that like making zombies? You know, they got all these zombie movies out there. You know, uh, all these, uh, these figures that walk around and the dead people and so on. These are zombie movies. Well, is that Judaism talk about zombie movies? So the truth is, it does in a way. Because God, in now in order to fix the future world, has to bring what? He has to resurrect the dead. Now, what does that exactly mean? That means in the end of time, in a little while, actually, very close to us, death will disappear from the world again. And Adam will be restored to what he once was, where he never died. That's right. You don't realize you are all waiting, right? For the greatest zomb zombie movie of all time. <laughs> you are key actors in this ultimate zombie movie because what will happen soon on the resurrection of the dead, the God will say, I'm gonna change it again and I'm gonna bring Adam back to what he was supposed to be. And you will no longer die. Your body and soul will come together and your soul would spiritualize your body and together they will go to the future world. In other words, we are all supposed to return to the state of other Mauritian before the sin. Yeah, that's really the essence of where we're going. And all of you have no idea about that. And you say that in the davening. What is the davening? In the davening you say after they put the toe away, what is it that say in the davening? It says, Hashi venu Hashem return me to you, God, and we will return to you. Renew our days as of old. Well, make up your mind. Do you want to renew your days or you want to go back to old? Is it new or is it old? So what that means is renew our days and return us to what was before Adam's sin. Before he did the sin, when suddenly the body and the soul will become one unit without death. That's right. That's the most powerful belief. And not only will the body and soul return together, you see it. Not only will that happen, you see it. But heaven and earth will suddenly come together. They no longer will be separated. In other words, when you are a human being on the planet earth, you will also sense 
the spirit universe while you're physically alive. You can't do that now. Now you can't feel the spiritual world. You've got to die to go to heaven or hell, but you've got to die. You're not getting in there. But there will come a time when God will restore all of you like the first man thought. And you will be, while you're alive, physically alive, you will be able to sense angels and the spiritual world automatically while you're physical. That's right. That's shocking, isn't it? Well, I never knew this, you're saying. I never heard of this. You know, what religion is this? But that's the central belief in Judaism. Because the resurrection of the dead is a central belief in Judaism, like Maimonides says in the 13 principles. One of the most important ideas is the belief that God will eliminate death, combine physicality and spirituality, and put it into one place. And suddenly you will no longer be a physical human, and you will no longer be a spiritual. You will be two of them together. Heaven and earth will come together. They will no longer be separated like it was by Adam when he was first created, where heaven and earth was together because he was never supposed to die. So this is the profound belief and a profound realization of what's going to happen. Now, why have I told you all this? I mean, really, I was supposed to be talking about the Mashiach, right? And suddenly I veered off and now I'm talking about death, life, dying, other religion. Well, where did I go off? What, what, what happened over here? Because in essence, that is why there are two Mashiachs. See, you don't realize this. What does it mean? What's the process of the resurrection? You see, when Adam was first created, his body was physical and spiritual. So it's like a translucent piece of glass. You know the translucent piece of glass? That's like the glass in a shower. When you have a shower and you put a glass to close up the shower, you can see light, but you can't see the person behind the glass. That means you can only partially see the light from glass. That's called translucent. And the person is supposed to do a mitzvah. And if he does a mitzvah, then the glass goes from translucent to transparent. In other words, suddenly his whole body becomes spiritual. And suddenly he's part of the spirit universe as a human being while he's physical. So translucent glass, where you can partially see light, now becomes transparent, where you can see right through the glass. Instead, what Adam did when he sinned was he made the translucent glass. He was supposed to go up from translucent to transparent. But because of the sin, instead of going up, he went down and the glass became opaque. What is opaque glass? It's glass that you cannot even see through. It's dark, it's black. And you cannot see through glass that's dark. So in other words, Adam, because of the sin, made it impossible to become spiritual. Instead, he made himself much more physical and the whole universe became much more physical. You see, it you know, instead of going up and making his body spiritual, up, he went down and made his body much more intensely physical. So what God says, now I will have to cause death where the body and the soul will be resurrected. And suddenly, your body will decay in the ground and disintegrate. And as it disintegrates, the energy of darkness will leave you. And once it leaves you, I will resurrect your body to become alive again with your soul in the body. So there's a whole process here. God's going to do something to the way you exist. You see, it, because God is going to be bringing you back to the condition of Adam Arishan, the first man, the way he was before he sinned. And in that condition, you will go to Olam Haba. And essentially, that's what the two, Mashiach, the two Mashiachs are. The reason why there's two is Mashiach, because one Mashiach, the Mashiach and Yosef, is in charge of disintegrating the dark and negative energy, which now resides in the body, and what the body has to go into the ground and decay, so that energy has to disappear. 
That's what would happen. So the Mashiach ben Yosef, the second Messiah, is responsible for what's called tahara. The word tahara means purification. Before you can go to heaven, you first have to purify the body, which is now contaminated with a negative force. And this, this uh, possibility is due, is in charge, the one who's in charge of it is the Mashiach ben Yosef. And once the body is resurrected and now it's clean because it's purified, so then the second Mashiach comes, the Mashiach ben David. And what he has to do is he has to raise the body to become completely spiritual and go to Olam Abba. That's called Kedusha. Because there are two verbs that are used in Hebrew, in Yedavim. You'd say, let God make me holy, and let my heart become pure. What's the word to describe purity, cleanliness, tahara? And what's the word that describes an elevation of spirituality? Kedusha. Those are two different verbs that apply to two different processes, both of which were undermined by Adam. So one Mashiach is in charge of cleaning you up. The second Mashiach is in charge of elevating you all the way up to Olam Abba. So there are two Mashiachs now that have two separate jobs. And so that's why there are two Mashiachs. The Mashiach when Yosef cleans you. He sees that the tumor that went into your body, the negative energy that went in your body because of the sin is eliminated. And the Mashiach ben David, the second Messiah, who will come after the Mashiach ben Yosef, is responsible for giving a holiness to your body so that suddenly you will go to Olam Haba, a place of eternity. So you see, the process is a little more complex than what you thought. You thought it was much more simple, didn't you? You thought, okay, so I die, I go to heaven, and then what? Then I'm in Ganeiden and so on. That's not what's going to happen. There's two steps to the process. And whether you recognize it or whether you realize it, you will be participating in that process, much to your own shock and so on. You know, because you have to be cleaned and made holy, two separate processes. You have to be cleaned from the negative energy of a sin, and then you have to be elevated to a higher level of holiness, where then suddenly you can go into eternity. And so that's why there are two processes. That's why there are two Mashiachs. So now I'm going to answer you a quick, I'm going to answer you fundamentally several questions. First of all, the first question is, why do we need an era of the Mashiach? Why? I'm waiting to go to Olam Haba, and then I'll be with God. So why do I need this half time with Mashiach? The reason why you need this half time, because you're all not clean. All humanity suffers from being unclean. What does that mean, unclean? That you have to take a bath? No, it means you're unclean because of the sin of Adam. The sin of Adam placed into you a negative energy, which now has to be removed. So that's the first step. So therefore, in order to do that, you need the most Mashiach. You need the Mashiach to come to basically clean you up before you become holy and go to the future world, which will be done by the second Mashiach. And this is a very fundamental concept. Now, why are there two Mashiachs? Because one is responsible for cleaning you up. That's the Mashiach from Yosef. That's the one we're all waiting for. You know, what are we waiting for? We're waiting to what's called the Geula. And the Geula means what? The redemption. But what do you mean redemption? You have to be redeemed if you are an exile. If you're not an exile, you don't need to be redeemed. So therefore, we are all in exile because our bodies and souls are separated. That's why we die. So the first thing that has to happen is that separation has to be removed and the body and soul has to come together. That's the first job of Mashiach ben Yosef. He's the one who's going to redeem us. The one we're waiting for is the Mashiach ben Yosef. He's the one who cleans. He's the cleaner. And the second Mashiach comes for Kedusha. He will raise all the people who are now spiritual and physical together into a place called Olam Abba, the eternal future world. 
That's what's going to go on. So therefore, we see something interesting. Your knowledge of what the Mashiach will do is extremely fundamental. You barely understand what's going to happen. Most people have no idea of everything I said today, really. But I have to tell you this. You can be in a state of shock when this starts to happen. When you walk into a cemetery and suddenly all the bodies come out of their graves, you're going to stand there and look and say, what is happening here? What is this, a science fiction movie? What is this, a horror movie? What, is, what does that mean? That there were people are getting up in the grave and they will be alive. You will be able to speak to Moshe Rabbeinu, that's right. Because the body of Moshe Rabbeinu will leave his grave and he will be a new person with a new body, in a sense, not already his old body, clean up. You will be able to have a conversation with your mother and father who maybe have passed away. You will be able to have conversations with all people who passed away. Do you have any idea what that is? You will be able to have a conversation with Isaiah, Yechezkel, with Yumio. You will be able to have a conversation with every human being who ever lived since the first man of the mission. That's right. You will be able to have a conversation with all of us. Could you imagine the party that humanity will make when that happens? You can't even begin to imagine when all the prophets will be in one party and they'll all say to you, hey, Shlemy, how are you doing? You know, I had a long uh, sleep when I was in the grave, but that's over. I'm a new man. Yes, that's right. This sounds like science fiction. It sounds like a horror movie, but really it's a salvation of humanity because God is going to restore mankind to the ultimate destiny, which is eternity. But he has to do this to save you because when you sin, you actually unplug from God and you jeopardize your ability to exist. So God has to do this. He has to clean you up from the sin because unless he cleans you up from the sin, you ain't going nowhere. But once he cleans you up, where your body disintegrates in the ground, it suddenly will be resurrected and then it will stand up and become a new person. And then you will be able to speak to every person who lived in human history. You will be able to speak to your Zayda, to your grandfather, and to your Zayda Zayda, and your Zayda Zayda. You'll be able to go back to someone that you're descended from 3,000 years ago. And you will say to them, Shalom Aleichem. You know what I mean? That's shocking. But this is what's going to happen. Because every soul that died will come back and become human again and physical again. And from there, everyone is going to go from there to the future world of heaven. That's what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. And that's what it says. That's what it says in Kabbalah. That's what it says in the Torah. This is all going to happen. So this is going to be a little like the most strangest horror story you've ever read. The most strangest science fiction story you've ever read. So this is what's going to be. But this is, is the salvation of man. So that even though man sins, God will still save him. See, that's what's happening. God is going to save all men that unplug and women that unplug from him. And even though they're unplugged in him and they should disappear, he will not let you disappear. He will redeem you from the exile of sin. But in order to do that, he first has to separate your body and soul. And they have to separate. One goes to heaven and one goes to the earth. And then he puts it together, cleans it. And suddenly you are exactly like you were when you were an Adam. You will return to the level of Adam himself. And that's the whole purpose of the Messiah, the Mashiach. To get you back to where you were. So that someday you can go to Olam Haba, clean and holy, without anything interfering in its own. Now, there's one more thing that I'd like to say. So I can ask you to have a little patience. I'm going to tell you something which is very strange. How will the Mashiach be able to restore the knowledge of God to mankind? No one has ever been able to do that. 
you know, there are many different religions in the world. And these people still believe in these ridiculous versions of religion. So how will the Mashiach been able to do this? With what? So the answer that I will give you, it's with a certain light. It's a light. It's called the 50th gate. The Torah is said to have 50 gates. Each gate is a certain level of wisdom. The 50th gate is the wisdom of the Mashiach. It's different than anything you've heard of, anything. Because even Moses didn't have that gate. He didn't have it. He was punished because of the golden calf. So what is the 50th gate? What does it do? What does it mean that you have it? You understand? And it's with this light that suddenly you will see things that you have never seen before. You see, you all see a very limited version of reality. But if I asked you all, if I pointed to any one of you and I say to you, are you married? And you say to me, yes. So I say to you, well, why did you marry your wife? Or I say to the woman, why did you marry your husband? So she will say, well, I met him. I thought he was a nice guy. I fell in love with him and so on. But I, if, if I say to you, why did God put you two together? She will say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where my husband comes from, or where I come from. We just met on earth and we got married. If I say to you, you have friends, and I say, who are your best friends? Well, my best friend is Chaim, Yanka, Shleim, and so on. Or my best friend is Rivka, Sora, Leah, and so on. And then I say to you, why do you have those people as friends? Why are they your friends? And you will say, well, I just met them, and they were nice people, and we became friends. But I would say, why really do you have these people as friends, and you have no one else? And you will say to me, I don't know. If I say to you, what kind of job do you have? So you say, well, I'm an engineer in a company. And I say to you, who gave you that job? Why are you working in this company? So you will say, well, there was an opening in the thing, and I applied. No, it's because God gave you that job. You don't understand. God determines every instance of what happens to you. He is all powerful and he is in control every minute. And he gave you that job. Why did God give you job, that job? You don't know. Why do you have friends that you have? Because God gave you those friends. In other words, God is responsible. Why do you have a certain wife and you don't have someone else? You know why? Because God decided this is the one, this is the husband or the wife you'll marry. So therefore, every real decision on who your friends are and what job you have and who your spouse is every, and who your children are. If I say to you, why do you have your kids? You have a lovely son. Why do you have the son? Why of all people of humanity was this son born to you? And you will say, I don't know. He's a nice kid and I love him but I have no idea why him. In other words, you have no idea of how your life is constructed in any piece of it. You could tell me, well, I met him and I fell in love with him. I met him and he was a nice guy. Uh, I met him and he was a nice son, a nice daughter. But you have no idea what your connection is to anyone in your life. So you have no idea why God put all of this to you but you have no idea, and so on. For example, you suddenly got sick, and you wound up in the hospital, right? And I say, well, what happened to you? Why did you wind up in the hospital? So you say, well, I guess I caught a disease. Well, why did God give you the disease? Why did he do it? I don't know. You have no idea why good things happen to you or why bad things happen to you. None at all. All you know that life is a series of random events that happened to you, and you respond to them. But you have no idea. It's as if life is random. Nothing has meaning. But there will come a time, I promise you, when you will know everything that I asked. You will know why you married a person. You will know why these are your friends. You will know why this is your job. You will know why these are your children. You will know your connection, your relationship, between your soul and their soul. That's right. You will understand your connection to them in terms of your soul and in terms of your body. One day you will know everything.
that God planned for you. And you will say, now I understand. I understand every feature of my life. I thought this was an accident. Nothing is an accident. Everything is designed by God in its proper place. But there will come a time when God will tell you that. How will you know? Well, I got news for you. Because all of you will one day see the 50th gate. You know what the 50th gate is called in the Torah? It's a Pasuk that describes it. It says, Oh, Hadosh, I'll see you on Torah. That means, the Pasuk means, a new light will shine upon Zion. What? A new light? What do you mean a new light? We have the Torah. That's an old light. What's this, a new Torah? No, it's not a new Torah. But it's a new understanding of what the Torah is saying which nobody understands now. So with that new information, you will have a clear and accurate understanding of everything happens in your life. Why it happened, how it happened, to who it happens. That has to do with the 50th gate. That's the gate. That's the entry point when suddenly everything becomes clear and suddenly you realize God has a plan. It's a plan. It's much deeper than you know. You only know a slight fraction of what he's doing in your life. But he has a plan and he has a program. And that program has to do with what will happen to you in Olam Abba. And you will know it because you will be entitled to see the 50th gate. And who's going to give you the 50th gate? Who? Who brings the 50th gate down? Which person has connection to that 50th gate? where suddenly he can answer every one of your questions. Why did this happen to me? Why did that happen to me? Why did I have these friends? Why did these friends, why did I have a fight with this friend and not this friend? You have no idea, but you will know exactly why someday. And who will have the 50th gate that he will be able to tell you? You who? Know? Mashiach. That's the power of the Mashiach. He has what's called the 50th gate. So therefore, he can answer everything that you have no idea exists. And suddenly you will understand the poem of your life, the, 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 the direction of your life. You will understand all of it, why God is doing everything to your life where now you know nothing. That's the 50th gate. That's the light of Mashiach. And that's the light that he will have when he becomes Mashiach. And he reveals that light to mankind. To even be more shocking, the biggest question that we all have, truly, what's the biggest question that you will have against God? The Holocaust. Why did God do the Holocaust? You have no idea. You should know. There's not a person who died in the Holocaust that wasn't meant to die. God does not kill people at random, just like this, because the Nazis wanted to do it. You should know something. Hitler could not get up in the morning if God didn't say, get up in the morning. If God didn't give Hitler the ability to get up out of bed, Hitler would be dead. So therefore, everything is God's plan. And we have no idea why he did this. But in the time of Mashiach, when the 50th gate comes down, you will suddenly know why everyone died in the Holocaust that he lived and so on. You will know and you will understand. And I'm telling you this. I'm going to tell you something shocking. When that day comes, you know what you're going to do? And you have no idea you're going to do it you will apologize to God. You will say, what are you doing? What do you mean a Holocaust? How could you bring the Holocaust on the Jewish people? And God said, someday when you have the light, when you know what I know, you will have pulled the switch too. If I gave you the opportunity to choose the Holocaust and pull the plug, you would have done it. Because the only difference between you and me, you don't know what I'm doing. You don't know that this is part of the program. That's the only way I can get these people and save them and to get them in Noel Mabba. It was in terms of God's knowledge. He knows that this is the only way that he could do it. And these are very deep things. But one day you will know that too. That's right. And then you will say, and God will expect an apology from all of you that we had no idea of what you were doing 
to these souls. And that day, you will apologize to God because you will understand exactly what he does and why he does it. So you see what the light of Mashiach does? It doesn't, it, it not just means it will come to you and you'll know certain things. No, you will know everything. Every hour of your life, you will know why you are on a certain street at a certain hour at a certain time. You will know why you got a ticket, a parking ticket or something at a certain time. You will know every person in your life why you are connected to them. This is not random. This is part of God's plan. And everyone in this room will know this plan perfectly. Now, is that information? And you will understand what God is doing. You will understand his logic, his reasoning. And you will say, I apologize to you. Why? Because you are God. And therefore, you know what you're doing. Even though I don't know what that is and so on. And I have to apologize profusely that you know what you're doing. And then God will say, okay, we're partners again. Now you understand who I am and what I do. But trust me, everything that I do is for your benefit. That's what he says to you. It's to save you. It's to give you the possibility of living with him in eternity, in a state that you have no idea and you will have that information. And that information will be granted to you by the Mashiach. Because it says in the end of Kailas, I'll call Dovah Ne'alam, Yovah Ben Mishpat, on everything which is hidden, and you have no idea, it will be brought to light. And suddenly, you will have a piece of the mind of God. That's right. You will be entitled to know. God will not have done anything to you that you don't, won't, won't know. God expects to tell you everything. He will not leave you in the dark. That's right. He will not say, well, I'm God and I know and it's none of your business. No, he will not say that. He will tell you why and you will understand him. But you will understand why he does what he does. And that everything he does is for your benefit and for the goodness of the future world that's going to come. That's imminent. Every person in this room has a certain sense that he never had before. When you look at what's happening in America, you know, when you look at what's happening with Biden and the administration and the world with Ukraine, you see something, you're all afraid. You see the world is going nuts. Something has happened to America where it's going nuts. And what's happened to America, we are imminently in front of the Mashiach. The Mashiach will probably be here and talking to each and every one of you in the next six months to a year. That's how close, that's how close you all are. And you will be shocked that this will happen because everything in history is changing in front of your eyes, but you don't know what's going on. I mean, I could tell you a little bit what's going on, but that's not the purpose of this lecture. But everything that's going on in front of your eyes is going on because it's designed by God himself. How and why? To redeem you to see to it that you will join him in the future world, in a world that there's no time and no space and so on. All of you will be part of that, trust me. And that's what he's doing, but you don't know what he's doing. So you have no idea, it's like, but does he know what he's doing? That's, you will have this question, but I guarantee you, God knows what he's doing. And he's doing things for your benefit and for what? for your benefit and for your goodness. So this is the new light. God will shine a new light on the Jewish people where they suddenly will understand everything, when suddenly everything will change. And this is about to be. So in a way, I'm preparing you. So you can't say, I didn't know. I had no idea. You know, this sounds like an astonishing story, which I have no idea what he's doing. I'm doing this, I'm standing here, not just to give a share. You think I'm giving a share and so on. I'm not giving you a share. I'm telling you what's about to happen and which you will about to be a part of and you will know. I'm preparing you for an imminent arrival of Mashiach. And that's why I'm giving this lecture. 
That's why I chose this topic. Not because I thought it was an interesting topic or it's a topic that will shock you, which it does, but to let you know what's going to be sh shortly. So our prayers the following may be the will of God that this be the time of Mashiach and the delight he has intended to shower upon us all come true and suddenly we should all be raised, all Jews and even all the human beings on the world, even the Goyim, to a new level and a new light. And we should all say, Amen. Amen.